In the first dimension, we can draw a line. In the second, we can use both the x and y dimensions to draw a circle. And in the third dimension, we add the z-axis and draw a sphere. What about when we go into the fourth dimension? What shape do we derive, and how do we calculate its volume? It is useful to look at the volumes of the shapes we already know and can easily visualize. This might make it easier to figure out what changes we need to make to generalize to higher dimensions. Starting off in the first dimension, the length of the line is two times its radius by definition. Since a line does not have a width or a height, we can say that its volume is equal to its length. For the second dimension, the area of a circle to be pi times its radius squared. We can see a very intuitive proof for that by imagining cutting the circle up into different pieces. First into four pieces. Rearranging them next to each other, we see a curved rectangle appear. Cutting further into eight pieces, and arranging similarly, we see the rectangle becomes less curved. The more pieces we have, the closer to a rectangle the arranged pieces will make. The goal is to make the distance between each piece arbitrarily small and approaching zero. The resulting rectangle will have the same area as the original circle, which is equal to the length of the rectangle multiplied by its width. The width of the rectangle is just half the circumference of the circle, since half the circumference makes up one side and the other half makes up the other side. This will give us pi times radius for the width, and the height is equal to the radius. Multiplying everything we get, pi times r squared for the area of the rectangle, and thus the area of the original circle. In the third dimension, the volume of a sphere is 4 divided by 3 times pi times its radius cubed. The proof of this can also be seen geometrically. We divide the sphere into equal pyramids, where each base of the pyramid is a square on the surface area of the sphere. The volume of the sphere is equal to the sum of volumes of the pyramids, and each pyramid's volume is 1 third base times height squared. The height of each pyramid is just equal to the radius of the sphere, so we need to sum the base of each pyramid multiplied by the radius of the sphere divided by 3. Taking radius divided by 3 in common, we are left with the sum of the area of the bases. Since the bases are squares making up the surface area of the sphere, then their sum is also equal to the surface area of the sphere, which is equal to 4 times pi times radius squared. Multiplying by radius divided by 3, we get the well-known 4 divided by 3, times pi times radius cubed formula. So, what does the volume become for a four-dimensional hypersphere? To figure that out, we must derive the general formula for an n-dimensional sphere. We are going to need to start somewhere unexpected. We need to find the area under a Gaussian curve, or in other words, the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the minus x squared. The reasons for this are complicated and beyond the scope of this video, but you can find an explanation for why this works in this Mathematics Stack Exchange post. This isn't an easy integral to take on its own, but a neat trick can be to square it and then take the square root of the final result after we're done. Squaring it will give us the integral of e to the minus x1 squared dx 1 times the integral of e to the minus x2 squared dx2. We can combine this into a double integral to make it easier to compute, becoming the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of e to the minus x1 squared times e to the minus x2 squared dx1 dx2. Then, since we have a common base, we can add the exponents together to get the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of e to the minus x1 squared plus x2 squared dx1 dx2. After changing to polar coordinates by setting x1 squared plus x2 squared equal to r squared and using a u substitution, we get the answer of pi. Finally, taking the square root of that, we have the answer to our original integral, which is the square root of pi. So why did we do any of that? 
Well, we saw that we had to change to polar coordinates to compute that integral. By using hyperspherical coordinates, we can generalize it to an n-dimensional sphere. So instead of our previous integral, we raise it to the power of n instead of the power of 2 and use the exponent combination trick we used before to obtain the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of e to the minus x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared all the way to xn squared dx1 to dxn. We know that the answer will be the square root of pi to the power of n. That's not new. But what is new is the hyperspherical coordinates approach we will use now. By setting x1 squared plus x2 squared all the way to xn squared equal to r squared and doing all the required substitutions, we end up with the integral of e to the minus r squared times r to the n minus 1 dr multiplied by the integral of d omega n minus 1. Now this can seem quite overwhelming, but you don't need to know all the complicated mathematics to proceed from here. Luckily, we know that the first integral computes to one-half the gamma function with input n over 2. The second integral, being the angular part, gives us the surface area of an n-sphere. Now we're almost at the finish line. A quick aside about the gamma function. The gamma function is a well-known function that is commonly used to extend the factorial function into complex numbers. The general form is given by gamma at input n is equal to n minus 1 factorial. To extend it to complex numbers, Danielle Bernoulli defined it using the following convergent improper integral. Gamma at input n is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of x to the n minus 1 multiplied by e to the power minus x dx. The gamma function is the most popular and useful extension of the factorial function, being applicable in fields such as probability, statistics, and combinatorics. Now back to the hypersphere business, we are ready to continue trying to find the surface area of a sphere. Since we know that integral computes to one-half the gamma function with input n over 2 multiplied by the surface area of an n-sphere, and also that it is equal to the square root of pi to the power of n, we can set both sides equal to each other to find the general formula for the surface area. The surface area formula is equal to the square root of pi to the power of n divided by one half the gamma function with input n over two. With the surface area of an n-sphere, computing the volume is a piece of integral cake. All we need to do is integrate the surface area with respect to r, giving us this calculation. The integral of the surface area multiplied by r to the power n minus 1 dr. However, since we know the surface area is dependent on n and independent of r, we can move it to the outside of the integral. The remaining integral is r to the power of n divided by n. Finally, multiplying by the surface area, we find the general formula for the volume of an n-sphere with radius r is the following. The square root of pi to the n multiplied by r to the n divided by n over 2 times the gamma function at input n over 2. Substituting for n equals 2, we get the square root of pi squared multiplied by r squared divided by the gamma function at input 1, which is equal to pi times r squared divided by 1, or the area of a circle. Substituting for n equals 4, we get the square root of pi to the power 4 multiplied by r to the power 4 divided by 2 times the gamma function at input 2, which is equal to pi squared times r to the power 4 divided by 2 times 1, resulting in pi squared times r to the power 4 divided by 2, which just so happens to be the volume of a 4D hypersphere. And now you can use this formula for any dimension you like. 